Go be clean. <laughs> Hold these. Can't do this in the dark. Okay. Now it's probably off again, right? No. Huh? Yes? I hope he gets a nine, but well, this is, this is the other one. This was working. All right. Well, enough of these trivial questions. <laughs> reinforcing. Look at all that reinforcing. Okay. And it comes basically in two grades, 40 and 60. Uh, this is the, the common grade. This, this is kind of a, you'd have to order special. The, the higher strength, because, because this is, le is less common, it's more expensive. They, they manufacture that in oodles and goodles, I guess. And um, the reason you might use 40 the higher grade you go oops, with steel, as you raise the um, yield point of steel, what those represent are the yield points, right? You remember steel? Oh, turn that light on. Steel is a very, very linear material. And the, this, if this were the you know, structural grade 36, maybe, and you'd go up to maybe a structural grade 50, uh, 40 would be in between there, I suppose. 60 is a little bit higher. But each of these, they, they have a smaller, this one has a very long plastic range. This one has not quite as long plastic range. This one uh, doesn't have too much of a plastic range. And as you go higher, they get this end of the, this end of the range gets uh, shorter. In other words, it gets more brittle. This is the this is the ductility of steel, and the structural steel is, um, okay, we're going to try this. Structural steel being very ductile. Now, you remember which one it was? It was that one, probably. Wow, okay. <laughs> we'll get them later. <laughs> this guy, compulsive meat freak. All right. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah, it was on video, too. We, all right, we better clean them up. <laughs> Somebody else see that here. Hide it. All right. Um, <clears throat> right. Well, <laughs> so the, the higher you go with this number, the more brittle it gets, the stiffer it gets. You pass these things around. These, these are uh, deformed bars. Ooh, must be number four bars. Should be stamped on it. And, but uh, when I was looking at, at it, it, it looks like it's stamp 13, which sounds like millimeters to me. So these must be Chinese bars. I don't know. Um, but you can feel how stiff they are. Just that just feels so stiff. It's not like, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know what would be really low. The softer you go with steel, the, the lower in the range you come down here, the more easily you could bend it because you yield it sooner, right? You more easily can yield it. Uh, as you go up this range, it becomes harder. Well, to be used with concrete effectively, uh, you need uh, a higher strength steel uh, to, um, why is that? Oh, well. So there, to, to, to keep the proportion, I guess, right, uh, of the, the stress block up at the top and the, the amount of steel in the bottom. <laughs> anyway. It's, it works out better for strength to have about this range. If you go for pre-stressing, uh, it goes even higher, and that's even um, more stiff. That's like 120 KSI or even higher, 200-something KSI it gets up to. But those are very, those get to be very brittle. But you could, when you, if you tried to bend it, it would literally snap. You couldn't bend it. This you could. The 60 you can bend, you're not really supposed to cold field bend it. If you bend that stuff, you're supposed to radius bend it so that it doesn't get a, a, a sharp kink in it because it might crack. It would have a, a tendency to crack. And, and if, you, if you look at these bars in the picture, look how, what a nice radius those have. Somebody didn't just, just bend them, right? That was bent on a machine that put that radius in there. And it has that radius to prevent it from cracking because it's so very stiff. If you have field bent, a, a situation where sometimes you do have to bend it in the field because it's cast and then it's bent into a position, 
uh, that would be the instance where you'd use the, the uh, softer steel, a little bit softer. Uh, anyway, yeah, it, as you go higher, I think there is a grade 75. Uh, certainly, my experience, yeah, try <laughs> with the uh, uh, pre-stressing tendons, they do snap. You can't, you can't even, you can't bend them. They snap so quickly because they have such a short, a short range here. Anyway, so. Uh, that's about what you'd know about steel. The concrete keeps it from rusting. Concrete, uh, the cement being so very uh, high alkaline, uh, it prevents the uh, steel from oxidizing as long as it's totally embedded. So that's kind of the reason for embedding it. That it still can, the concrete like in that uh, PCA film will always have cracks and pores in it. So some, like on a uh, bridge deck, for instance, around here, particularly where we put a lot of salt, it's, it's inevitably going to leach into the, the uh, pores of the concrete and get to the, the reinforcing. So in, a, in that kind of a, a situation, you've probably seen these reinforcing bars that are kind of bright green or sometimes they're painted. That's an epoxy coating that can be put on them to prevent them from rusting. Doesn't do anything for the strength, but it does prevent them from rusting quite as quickly. Uh, they're in eighth inch sizes, um, so this would be four eighths, six eighths, and they're always just given the number. Like a number 10 is 10 eighths, uh, so number eight bar would be, and that's the diameter, a one inch diameter. A number 10 bar would be an inch and a quarter, right? <laughs> Something like that. Diameter, they go up to, I think the biggest size is about an 18, which is, that's getting to be bigger than what you can really even lift and handle. Uh, the deformation patterns that you notice on those things are, are on there to, to give it a little bit better mechanical bond. Sometimes you specifically want the bar, like if you have a, a, uh, a cold joint in, say, like slat in roadways, they do this, where, where they've got a, a joint in the roadway, either expansion joint or just a cold joint, and they'll have the, they stop casting with the bars sticking out, and the next cast and it's, there's deliberately supposed to be a joint there that slips, like an expansion joint. Uh, you can use smooth bars, and, and they'll have the, the keen in this direction, but, but allow it to move. So that might be a, an application of where sometimes you don't want the deformations. Uh, spacings are dictated in, in a beam or even in, in this sort of a, this is a, this is actually a bridge. It's a, the, um, it's shaped like, I think I drove over this bridge, in fact. It's shaped like, like this. So this is, this is how they, they cast this part. This is what you see right now. See so U underneath, and then the deck goes up on top, and this would be left open. You could, I don't know, walk through it, maybe take tours, <laughs> run pipes. Uh, anyway, but you can, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the spacing. Uh, so the spacing here is dictated by, uh, first, the strength. You've got to have enough bars in there at a certain space to provide the strength, but you can't have them too close together or you can't cast it. So as a minimum, one inch um, would be, you know, you can't have many close. And, you know, that's just a, a rule of thumb, basically. Also, uh, depending on the aggregate size, four-thirds the, the max aggregate. So if you've got really big aggregate, then you have to space it a little wider. Um, Mm, or the, bi the bar diameter, you know. So those, those as guidelines uh, determine the spacing between bars, between layers of bars, like you see these are in layers. There's a back layer and a front layer, or, or down here you've got layers. They're, they're further apart, but a minimum would be an inch. And then there's, then there's a coverage that, that provides uh, just protection for the steel against rust. And the, sometimes you see, like in that film, they showed instances of where that spalled off in a parking garage. The ceiling was because of some mm, failure of the mix design or something. Uh, and then, then you've got a problem because the steel rusts, and that is bad. Okay. Uh, a couple other little notes here. Strength increases with age. Yeah, that's good to realize, I guess. This is... Uh, one day, two days a week, 28 days. So you see, and this is the strength. So the, uh, if you took, this is, these are all different cement ranges. If you said this is uh, 
one cement, then there's one day uh, it's like 500, here it's maybe 1,200, right? Here it's 2,000 something after a week. Usually a week is the range where it has enough strength that you take the forms off of it. And then the full strength is reached at 28 days. That's the full design strength. Actually, it continues to gain in strength over time. Uh, and depending on the mix, um, it, you know, has more, it gains more strength beyond that, but it's usually not uh, accounted for. This, the, in the other direction on these graphs, this is the water cement ratio. So you see how that affects it. This is a water cement ratio of 0.4 versus 0.6. And there's, uh, that's not, that's, that's, I think I mentioned last time, the water to the cement, not the water to the concrete. And the cement is a pretty small part of the mix. The cement's just the glue in there. So you've got far more rocks and sand than you have cement, uh, usually. So the water to the cement, it's not really very much water you're talking about. If you've only got, you know, like half as much water as you have cement, uh, and you change it from half as much to, uh, you know, point <laughs> one more, it's not a lot of water. So a little bit of water can make uh, a big difference in, in the behavior of the cement. If you've ever mixed cement, you, you realize this. You put a little bit of water in it, and suddenly it changes uh, its mixability quite a lot. It also affects the strength quite a bit, you know, particularly, you know, the ultimate strength. Look at this. I mean, if I went from here 4,000 at maybe that's... Uh, 0.52 or something, and I go to point, well, no, 0.48, that's the wrong side, to 0.58. Yeah, maybe that's only about one tenth, right, in that range, and it dropped a thousand from maybe there to there. So it, it does have a very, the point is it has a, uh, a very large impact on the, on the ultimate strength of the concrete, how much water it's in. That's why in that film, the fellow that was, you know, they had a, thing at the site. The trucks all come with a, the ability to add water, but you have to be very careful about that uh, because as you add water, you're, you're changing the water cement ratio, and that, that then can really screw up your strength. Uh, okay, all right, enough of that. Uh, the strength is measured ultimately by testing it, and the standard test is one of these cylinders. This is, a, this is an empty empty mold for one that I happen to have. So you see there's six by 12 standard cylinders. You'd have that at the site. You cast it full. It, it's actually, you know, you have to do it kind of carefully. You, you take a wheelbarrow out of the middle of the truck or something or the certain point of the truck, not the first and not the last, and then you, you, you fill it, you know, first a little bit and rot it and a little bit more and rot it and all the way to the top and rot it and strike it off. And it's a, it's a procedure, an AS10 procedure, and the idea is that you want consistency. You want that test to always give you the exact same results. So if you do it, you know, if you just throw all the concrete in at once and kind of, <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> bang it around, <laughs> it will not give you the same results because you've, you, you, you've not made it the same. It's like baking a cake, you know? If you, you throw the eggs in one day, and next day you throw something else in first, you stir it or you don't stir it, you know, hey, that makes a difference, right? So <laughs> you gotta bake your stuff the same way if you want the same results. And then you test it uh, after 28 days. It's usually, what well, has to be, uh, moist cured. So it's always cured exactly in the same way. That means in, in a, it's not allowed to dry out. It's put in a humidity chamber generally, or could leave it underwater, I guess. But um, So it fully cures. And then you put it in one of these machines and you test it. And the crushing strength of it, the, the, the ultimate crush is that that value right there, F prime C, uh, and that then is used uh, to specify the concrete. That's when you say, I want 4,000 PSI concrete. This is the, that's what you're saying, 4,000 F prime C, which comes from this test. And this, is, this just shows one that's been tested. They usually split on a diagonal. It's a shear failure through a nice failure. That one's, I should try and find a better picture. I used to do this a lot. You know, they, they split with a sheer cone. You actually get a little cone that pops out of it. You can do a tensile strength where you, lit, you set the cylinder on its side and load it this way, and the stresses build up and split the cylinder 
along a line, and you can actually get the tensile stress like that through, through compressing it, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and that's usually about a tenth, uh, 10 percent to 20 percent of F prime C. So that's not much, and it's in design, it's not mm, accounted for, or you, it's neglected. You don't, you assume that it doesn't have any tensile capacity at all. It has a little bit, but the reason it's uh, would be neglected if you ever, if you have, say, a beam and it ever gets loaded to capacity or even slightly overloaded, then it's cracked all the way up to the neutral axis or, you know, it's not going to uncrack. Once it's cracked, it's cracked. It's not like a steel beam that, okay, maybe it, maybe it yielded a little, but once you take the load off, it goes back, the stress is reduced and, and it's not broken. It could, again, be loaded and it would pick up you know, as, except it might have a little bit of strain in it, but it, it would not be, this would be physically altered. It would be cracked. Okay, uh, Young's modulus, you could also get through testing, uh, but usually through an equation that, that uh, more or less uh, gives these curves. This is, you can see, for 3,000, 4,000, this is F prime C, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, so the, the higher strength you've got, the, the stiffer the concrete is, I mean, the, yeah, the higher strength it is, the stiffer it is. The, these curves get steeper, so the, the E modulus is dependent on the grade of concrete. This, this thing that's plotted here, just as a reference, that's steel, okay? That would be 24 KSI. I mean, steel's going way on up there. If it's going to 60 <laughs> KSI, it's like three times higher than the board, right? So it, compared to the concrete, uh, it's quite a lot. This is taken then as, as usually the failure point, uh, 0.002. No, it should be 003. Wonder why that is too. Or maybe that's, this, that's lining up with that for some reason. I forget what that is, but 003 is usually concrete failure. Is defined as failed. Um, okay, so then these are just, this. if you have, this number here is the weight of the concrete, the density. Usually it's 144 pounds per cubic foot. That comes out pretty consistently, amazingly consistently. Because the rocks, uh, you know, the aggregate usually weighs about the same as the pace, so there's not going to be that much variation in it all. Uh, if you have lightweight aggregate, though, then, then of course, the weight goes down. Uh, or if you have a <coughs> air entrain, well, air entrainment doesn't affect it very much. but um, as long as you've got standard weight concrete, this just becomes a constant then, uh, which gives these numbers down here. So these are typical E moduli for, uh, for concrete then. And you can see, I mean, this is in the order of magnitude of wood, right? Wood, we just looked at wood, didn't we? And that was like one million. This is three million. So it's, it's, Okay, three times more than wood, but it's in the sort of in the order of magnitude of wood, as opposed to steel, which is uh, an order of magnitude higher, right? Twenty-nine million, right? It's another. It would be ten times ten times these numbers. You know, three. You take thirty thirty thousand ksi would be steel. So it's it's an order of magnitude less than steel. Order of you know ten times less stiff than steel. Uh, but kind of, and it's funny, you don't think of it as being in the range of wood because you're, you're, you're used to how wood is kind of flexible, right? Walking on a wood floor, walking on, you've, you've kind of dealt with wood a little bit. You have a sense of how bouncy it is maybe. Concrete is also bouncy like that. It is bouncy. Uh, the, the reason you may not sense it is usually pretty thick. Uh, a thick beam is not going to be particularly bouncy, but, but um, in, as a thin shell, if you ever, you know, <laughs> get up on those, or even a, even a slab on a floor, uh, it does have quite a bit of deflection and, and bounce to it. Um, yeah, anyway. Okay, the um, flexure and shear in beams, okay, in terms of where, how the reinforcing is placed. Uh, you, the reinforcing's in there to resist uh, a positive moment, right? The, the, the tensile uh, forces. 
uh, well, to resist tensile forces, I shouldn't say positive moment. Here, if it's a positive moment, it'll be in the bottom, where you have a negative moment like over a cantilever, uh, over a support, or on a cantilever, then, then, you, then the reinforces, reinforcement would be on the top. So it doesn't, it's not like it always just goes on the bottom. It depends on where the, the tens tension is. If it is a cantilever, then it's up on top. So this would, there was a, uh, a famous story of uh, some buildings that were somewhere down in, I don't know, some, some little town in South America. And they had, they had uh, balconies, these nice balconies that, that were uh, concrete. And they had uh, steel naturally in the top side of it because they were uh, cantilevered, being balconies. <laughs> and uh, they were going to have some, some big uh, parade. So, you know, this was the uh, general. He's got a general's hat on there. And with his dog, always goes with his dog, marching along this street, right? And, and all the people are coming out on the, the balconies. And, and to plan for this ahead of time, they're waving. Uh, they decided what would be a good thing to do, we should reinforce all the balconies. So they came out and they, they put uh, wooden posts um, to, to reinforce the balconies. Well, when they put the wooden posts under them, they changed them from being cantilevers to simple beams. And the, the reinforcement, or the positive, went from a negative moment to a positive moment. And there wasn't, of course, any, any uh, reinforcement at all in the bottom of it. So when all of, they had disaster, it was sad, it was terrible. It was worse than burning buildings, it was uh, no, I think it just cracked, actually. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it was very embarrassing. So you have to pay attention to, to where, I mean, you, you can change, change the moment. And, and, and in situations where loads change, you have to have uh, reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement maybe in the top and the bottom. Sometimes you have doubly reinforced beams. You can deliberately, even though it's just a simple span, doubly reinforce it. Uh, which um, also strengthens the compression concrete and gives you a little bit uh, more stiffness, allow you to make a slightly smaller section. Okay, this is the, the, for a positive moment then, this would be the positioning of the steel down in the bottom. Uh, this piece around the outside, this is a, a stirrup, which you may have seen these things before. If you had, they would go like this in the beam, right? They'd be primarily, this is going to be the highest shear back here, so they'd be close together there. You could spread them further apart where the shear is less. Um, but those, those are carrying the shear force. The, the concrete has a, a fair amount of shear strength, and at some point you don't need them. If the shear is not too high, you don't, well, you don't need them. But I think it has, if it's as low as half the, half the um, shear capacity. Of the concrete. The concrete's pretty good in shear because it's rough, and if it's got good aggregate, it would it doesn't split real easily. Um, anyway, so those take up the the shear strength. These these bars here, um, if they were all in one layer, then the their centroid would of course be right at the center of the bars. If you've got more than one layer, then you have to maybe calculate where the center of gravity is you know, based on these areas. And wherever that center of gravity is, that, that defines this distance D. This is used, you'll see, if, if I hurry up, uh, is used in designing then the, uh, the strength of the column because this <coughs> forms, the, the concrete down here is basically just in there for cover, uh, for protection. But it doesn't add, this doesn't add any strength. The strength is between here and here. So this is, this is the B and D or the dimensions that that uh, uh, determine the, the size in terms of strength. Um, what else do we need to know there? Oh, probably nothing. OK. So working stress design. There are two, there are two methods that uh, this, is the, this is the, zoom in on this, the ACI 318. So this is an old one. It's, I think, now up in 2005 or something. <laughs> I forget when the last one was. This is, uh, but back in the early 
80s, they changed from this method, the, the working stress design, to uh, a method that we'll learn in a couple of weeks is the um, strength design or ultimate strength design. This method is still described in an appendix back here somewhere as the uh, WSD method. It's based on allowable stresses. So the same, you remember we talked about allowable stress design versus, um, uh, what's the other one? LRFD, load resistance factor design. Factor design versus uh, allowable stress design. So this is, this, the, the approach here is uh, very similar to what we've done so far with wood and what else have we done? That's all, is it? Did we, no, we didn't do steel. Did we, yeah, we did do steel beams. Who remembers? Kind of hard to, oh yeah, we did, okay. So it's the same. It's the same as what we did with wood and steel. Um, and to make that work, you have to, there are a few limitations on it because, because in that um, procedure, if you use, well, in, in linear uh, design, the, let me see, we did, let me describe it this way, with with wood beams, right, we looked at a, uh, and we did this with the composite sections too, we looked at a, a strain distribution like that, right, and this was the neutral axis, and this, this then had a, uh, stresses that, whoops, followed that, should have been down there somehow, and the strains are, are linear and the stresses are linear, and the stress-strain diagram looks like that. So this, this matches this, that they're, and that, and this matches this. So they're all linear, and that's the assumption in uh, when we used MC over I, when we calculated I, and even, even the der derivation of MC over I is based on these assumptions. If you go back and, and look at, at when we first started looking at I, it was all based on a shape like this. Well, concrete behaves like that initially. This is steel, right? The concrete was more like this, right? Initially, initially it's kind of straight, but then after a while it's not too straight. And there's a, uh, maybe, maybe for about half of its life, if this is maybe 50% and this is 50%, so about half of its uh, um, before failure, it is linear. And then the last half, it's not very linear. So, so the approach, and, and this kind of shows it. Initially, it's kind of like this. The further, the more you, at, at a higher load, at a higher load you're going out further this way, it gets more uh, <coughs> nonlinear until at an ultimate load, at a very high load near failure, then this is definitely not, not linear. So the approach in, in WSD, in order to use these equations and these assumptions, they just limit you back to this range. They put a, a, a factor on it of a little bit less than half, 0.45, which keeps you back in what's basically a, a linear range of the behavior so that this is, you're, you're back in maybe in this range, maybe somewhere in here, I don't know. It, it's basically linear. And then everything, everything uh, can be calculated as before. And there's an, this is then taken as the allowable stress. It's far below the actual failure stress, but it's within the, the uh, um, uh, linear part of the, the stress strain behavior. And then the steel is also, uh, given an allowable stress, which you see is pretty low, like this is half, and this is uh, less than half. 24 for six, grade 60 and 20 for uh, grade 40 or 50. So those are the allowable stress levels. It assumes all this, you know, that the, the Hooke's Law controls. Um, it, the other thing, like we did with the um, composite, this is a composite material, right? And just like we, in dealing with the composites, in the last chapter, you, you still have to account for the disparity in the um, um, stiffness in Young's modulus. 
And that's done by making a transformed section. Remember, you, you took the one material and transformed it into an equivalent amount of the other material as if it were all made out of, say, wood. And then, and then you can calculate a, 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 a transformed moment of inertia. The same thing, same thing happens here. You, you have to find this modular ratio, uh, steel over concrete in this case, and it comes out then to be, uh, because steel's much higher, it'll be some whole number. In the, um, uh, in the book, he has a chart in the back that gives so you could put in, you know, um, your grade concrete and the, and the uh, grade steel, and it'll give you this N number. One caution is he rounds it off to a, one significant digit, you know, so it's like eight or nine or ten. I mean, they're just simple integers. Uh, that's probably close to good enough, but it might not get you within uh, two percent accuracy. <laughs> so, in terms of working the problem for this class, you better actually calculate it and and leave the decimal points on there, just to uh, make sure you don't get get clipped off the end of of two percent. Okay, so the way this sets up to, to um, analyze a beam using this, this is, this is the, the, uh, the cross section, the area of steel down here. Here's D is defined to the centroid of the steel. Uh, this is the neutral axis, okay, wherever that is. And this is just simply the distance down to the neutral axis. This is what's left over, right, from D. So d minus that amount is, is this amount. So that, the, that positions the neutral axis, at least with variables. Uh, this is the area of the concrete. This is, this is then the um, um, transformed section. You know, the, um, when we did transformed sections before, like what did we do? Hmm. Oh, we could do it like this. Say this was a piece of wood. Right, and, and had maybe a piece of steel on it, right? We did these just a few weeks ago. And you'd have, okay, you'd transform the, the steel into an equivalent amount of wood, so you'd have a picture that looked like, whoops, looked like that, right? So this would be the steel, this, the wood stays the same. Well, there's one difference with the concrete. When the, con the neutral axis would be here somewhere, I don't know. Uh, with the concrete, the area when you, if, if we said, this, instead of being a bar of steel down there, is maybe a bar of steel in there. When, when you load the concrete, it's going to crack, right, up to, up to that neutral axis, wherever the neutral axis is. So because it cracks, then you, you disregard that concrete. It's, it's useless. All it's there for, it holds the steel. Obviously, it's got to hold the steel in place. If, you, if it disappeared, the steel would fall on the floor and it would not be there. But uh, it, does, it does hold the steel in place, but it doesn't supply any strength and flexure. You can imagine, I mean, you're thinking of it like this, right? Here's a load on it. And if it's cracking like this, well, then <laughs> this part in between the cracks, the concrete's not doing any good. The only part up here is, is the part that's in compression is going to, to hold the load. So what you do in, in drawing the, new, the, drawing the uh, transformed section, you erase that concrete. You just take it out. So that's, that's why you've got that box up there at the top. The steel's still there, though. So here's the, here's the uh, whoops, <laughs> maybe a little thick. OK, here's the transformed steel, something like that. Now, the steel, you could make it, I mean, in your diagram, if you want to, you could say, well, how thick should I make it? Should I make it? it really wouldn't be right to make it the thickness of the bar because the bar is round, right? It's thicker in the middle and thinner at the top. So you could, you could scratch your head trying to figure out what to do about that. Uh, but in truth, it doesn't, have, it doesn't have much. The bars alone over a length, like the length of a beam, don't, they're not contributing to stiffness. They're contributing to strength, but not, not stiffness. So this is given no, no depth dimension. It's just, it's just an area. It's an area without, in other words, you just don't, you don't worry about that depth. It's just not useful to, to calculate how, how the little bit that it would contribute to the strength of the beam is not significant.
So it's just taken as an area down there um, without worrying about the depth. And the dimensions are just, you know where the center of it is. The dimensions go to the center of it. Um, what else we need to know? And then this is the stress diagram. Uh, this is the, uh, represents the compression stress of the concrete. This is the compression stress in the steel. Okay, so these would be, and with the, the, the steel's been transformed, so this is the, uh, the N modular ratio. So it's Fs over N. Now the, the thing is, in this, in analysis, you don't initially know what these values are. The same as with, uh, when we did the, the calculations with um, composite sections, you, you drew this, you could go through a strain compatibility analysis, but you don't know the stresses initially. You have to find which material fails first, essentially, or, or before you'd be able, because one of these will reach its limit first. You assume, you're assuming, I guess, that you're going to fail one or other, one of the two materials, but you wouldn't, I mean, from this diagram, you wouldn't really know which one failed first, I guess. Um, you can set up relationships, though, that will kind of tell you which one fails first. Let's see. First, this modular ratio. All right, that's maybe we should go down this list. Okay, so you build this. You know, well, you get this, then you build that based on this. Uh, then you calculate where the neutral axis is. Ah, that's interesting. The neutral axis, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> that, it's, if, um, if I had... If I didn't take this away, right, if that, like every beam you've done so far, it has that tensile zone below the neutral axis. It's easy to calculate the neutral axis, right? It's just that little formula, uh, the summation of, of AD over summation of A, right? It's not, not a big deal. But here there's a little bit of a trick because the position of the neutral axis affects the shape of the section. Whoa, think of this, right? <laughs> Where, because, I mean, if the neutral axis is, is here, well, then the shape is different. If the neutral axis is down here, then the shape is different. So the, the, sh the shape of this thing that you're trying to uh, calculate changes by the very thing that you're trying to calculate, the, the position of the neutral axis. Oh, is that not bizarre? Well, so it uh, is a little bit more interesting than to figure out what that is. You have to set it up. Uh, in terms of, of some unknown distances, um, just kind of in general terms, and then solve, well, you end up solving for this x. That's why these are set up in terms of, of some x distance. Okay, this is, this is x, this is the unknown part here because it's determined by the position of the neutral axis. So this would be mm, half of x, x bar c is half of x. This would be uh, d minus x, that part there. Uh, these, you can remember when we first talked about when we were defining uh, what, how, what, the, what is the significance of a neutral axis, you can think of it as uh, the balance point, right? If you had, remember we did those center of gravity calculations. You have, here's a, here's a cross section, you can think of it as an area, here it is, at the point where it balances, that's the neutral axis. Right? If it's a different shape, if it has uh, something heavier at this end, right, then it's going to, then the neutral axis shifts, but it balances. It's a balance point. And what defines that balance is a pair of moments. Right? If, I take, if I take, say, my thing here, try and draw it. Right? Okay, this is it. Here it is balancing. Okay, there's a fulcrum, and, and there's a there's a center of gravity, right, for that rectangle. Here's the center of gravity for that rectangle. So these, this might be uh, R1, R2, and this, this moment, which is, you know, that times that, this would be R, whoops, R1 times D1 has to be balanced by this moment, right? So this tendency to rotate, it's balanced by that tendency to rotate, and then there, that's, that's balanced, right? That's how, that, like the seesaw, like Archimedes, that all goes back to that. Anyway, so that's exactly the same thing that's going on here. You just have to find that balance point. So you take, the, and you're balancing areas. You take this area times its uh, little moment arm there, and this area 
times its longer moment arm, and they've got a balance. And that sets up this equation right here. Then all you have to do is solve that equation for, um, it's all in terms of x, solve it for x, and you've got, then suddenly that positions this. Oh, that's wonderful. OK, pretty cool. So then what? Then, then you got this transform section. Well, once you've got the transform section, you can calculate the moment of inertia. That's the same as what we did with other composites. Calculate the moment of inertia. Then you calculate the, um, ooh, yeah, that's this. And then you can calculate the, the stresses, put the moment of inertia in here, and calculate the moments. These, then, you'll find one higher than the other, and the lower one controls. So this is exactly what we did with composite materials. You, one method, anyway, you calculate the two moments, and the, one of them fails first. You determine which one would fail first, essentially. So to do a quick example before we run out of time, um, here's a given beam. The steel is given three number nines, which has area of three. Uh, there's 17, OK, is the distance here. That's D. OK, so we draw this little picture here. We assume it's cracked all the way up to there, but we don't know where there is exactly. That's in terms of x. This is the area down here in tension. That's 27, 3 times 9. Uh, excuse me. No, that, that's AS. A, that should be S. This is uh, ASN. I'm sorry, ASN. This is, yeah, it's the area in tension. This is N. Somewhere it's the modular. Where'd it go? It's this. I don't see where it's calculated, though. Oh, here it is. That 9 is that 9. OK, so that gives us 27 for that area. This area, we only know in terms of x, 12 times x. Uh, but we can set up then this equation, right? This is the area. There's this distance. That's that little distance there is x over 2. 27 is that area. And this distance here is the 17 minus x. So you run that through. You end up with a quadratic. You solve the quadratic equation. Oh, isn't that lovely? This is exciting. And you end up with two, two possible roots, and you take the one that's positive because it can't be negative. So that, it's a little bit of a, a step, but it's so rewarding when you get to the end, you know? And that then all that gives you is, is the, the distance there. Now, you can, now you've got a complete picture. You can go ahead and calculate the moment of inertia. It's a little bit, a little bit simpler for, for these things than it might be if you use this approach. This right here, in the past, we've used uh, BD cubed over 12 right, for a rectangle. But that assumes a neutral axis through the centroid. There's another formula, if you look in the back, for, for shapes that assume the neutral axis at the base, which is exactly what this is. So you can take that BD cubed over 3, which it would be the formula for that. That's that component. The other component would be of you know, the normal formula for this, right? A summation of i's uh, plus, oops, summation of ad squared, right? This whole thing together is, is wrapped up in that bd cubed over 3. The other one, the steel, we essentially neglect this one. We drop that one out because it would be fairly small for the thin bars. They'd only have, and again, you get into the issue of what's the depth. You'd have to calculate them for a circle, and it's, it doesn't turn out to be very uh, much. So that, that's negligible. Whoops. And, and you get, you're just calculating that term. Then you can add the two of them together, and that gives you the total. Uh, there's a the moment of inertia. Now, you just plug them into these equations this is, and find which moment controls here. This is the moment for the concrete. So this is the stress for the concrete. This is, that, this is the same in both cases. And this is the distance up to the neutral fiber. So that's that distance there. The steel, the steel uses the other distance, C, and you have to put the, the uh, modular ratio back on it. And it also has its own stress. So you put those numbers in, and then you come out with two possible moments it would fail first at this one, is what this is telling you. So it fails at 74 uh, foot kips. Uh, that would then be the beam capacity. This is, and notice it does, with these numbers I put in, it came out in inch kips. 
and then I converted it. That's what's going on there. Right? So then you can go back. If you wanted to know what the, this then says the stress in this, if this is controlling, then that's, that's the stress in the steel, right? So the question might be, well, what is the stress in the concrete actually? That you could plug back in and get it like that, or you could go back, you could go back to this and plug in, because you know it's just this picture right here. You could plug in um, the, the steel stress, you'd have to divide it by the N, so you put, what was it, 20 divided by 9 down here. That must be like 2 point something, 2.2 2 maybe. Uh, and then you know these distances you could calculate. So it has to build this diagram is the point. In the end, it has to come back to that. That was your assumption to begin with. And if you check it, it would be, oh, let the, let the inquisitive student check <laughs> whether this comes out right. Put, put in into this diagram and make sure the similar triangles add up and that that is really uh, linear. In other words, you know, these two should be similar triangles, right? And give you uh, this same number for the, the stress on the concrete. Okay, I didn't get as far as I wanted to, but that's enough to do something. <laughs> <laughs>